Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Murrow-Seiler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Laurel Berkeley with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks will be talking about the effects of grazing on greater sage grouse and their habitat in central Montana. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Our, join us for our next webinar on March 25th by Moose Jaw River Watershed Stewards about biosecurity and invasive species. And you can register for this webinar through the PCAP website. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel, and this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. I'd also like to mention that in March, uh, PCAP will be hosting a week-long series of webinars called Prairie's Got the Goods Week, all about the ecological goods and services provided by the Native Prairie ecosystem and Native Prairie wetlands as well. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. I'd also like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pampana Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, SaskTel, and Wildlife, Han Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Camp Wolf Willow, Rancher Stewardship Alliance Inc, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. And to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard anytime during the presentation. If you're on a cell phone app, you can send your question by chat to the organizer. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a little bit about today's presenter. Laurel Berkeley, PhD, has been a biologist with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks since 2011. She currently works with prairie grouse, but also collaborates on work with songbirds and invertebrates. She has a background in wildlife ecology and management with a bachelor's degree and PhD from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, and a master's degree from the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Laurel has had the pleasure of working with several species, including monarch butterflies in Minnesota, acorn woodpeckers in California, California, dick sizzles in Nebraska, rough grouse in Minnesota, and greater sage grouse in Montana. And her favorite place is Montana. Broadly, her career focuses on conducting applied research that can be used in wildlife management and conservation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Laurel. Great, okay. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I think, um, you just, yeah, if you just play the presentation or launch it how you normally would. And then just under display settings at the top and then just switch the, um, the view. There we Swap go. View. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, let's get started. So yes, my name is Laurel. Um, I work with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about our, our um, big 10 year research project at FW, FWP on greater sage grouse. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Mark Sapinski, who um, led the day-to-day -day field effort um, on this project for the full 10 years. Um, Jennifer Helm, who is currently a PhD student on this project, and Victoria Dreitz, who's um, associate professor at the University of Montana and director of the Avian Science Center. All right. Um, I also like to acknowledge um, the several partners um, who have helped with this project along the way. Many of these partners we work with to help guide the research and make sure we're producing um, 
the products that everybody needs. Um, so we work with several federal, state, and local agencies, and of course, the University of Montana and Montana State University. Um, so there are a lot of people who have come together to, um, to make this project happen, especially the private landowners. Um, without those landowners, we would not have been able to do this project. Um, over half of our study area is in private land ownership, and um, they allow us, they generously allow us access to their land to monitor birds. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, and I like to emphasize that this is a 10 year study. Um, it's, it's not often in wildlife studies that we get to do um, very, you know, long studies like this. Um, and it's, it's really important for a few reasons, especially with this project. Um, because we're dealing with grazing and we're dealing with changing um, land management. And so whenever you implement new management strategies, um, it might take a few years for the land to actually respond, um, especially considering what condition it, you know, it might have been in when management began. So there might be a lag. Sorry to interrupt, Lorel. Um, sure. Would you be able to push that webinar dashboard to the side? Just click the orange arrow and it'll push it oh, off definitely. there. I apologize. There, thanks. We get no okay. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, great. Okay. Um, and then um, also because sage grouse um, might take a few years to respond to management once you implement a management strategy. Um, and so that was really we put a lot of emphasis on trying to make this a um, a ten year study and also um, to be able to get enough data to weed out variation from weather and other drivers. Um, and, act, and be able to focus on a grazing, a grazing effect if there was one. Um, so we have just finished data collection for this study, um, and we're in the process of writing up and getting final products out. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure everybody's level of knowledge about sage grouse is, but this is just to give you um, an idea of their distribution. They're found in both the US and Canada. Um, the light blue is showing um, their historic range, and then the dark blue is, is their, their current range. And so it's been constricted quite a bit, um, but they cover a huge area um, in the West. And depending on where you are in that huge range, um, is you know, the threats vary by where you are. And so um, these maps I'm showing, the blue polygons are US Fish and Wildlife um, management zones that they created. Um, and if the if the fill polygons are red, that means it's a high threat or higher than the other parts of the range and, and that orange or yellow is less of a threat. So there are, um, the main threat to sage grouse everywhere is habitat loss. It's, you know, fragmentation of the habitat or, or direct loss. And so, but that's due to um, a lot of different reasons. First one is energy development, which is a big deal in Wyoming and Montana. Um, infrastructure, which is a, a big deal everywhere. So power lines, roads that go in to deal with energy. Um, urbanization, so development, you know, maybe breaking up of rangeland or um, subdividing things like that, um, and uh, exotic species, so invasive species like cheatgrass, it's a big deal, um, especially in places like Utah and, and Idaho, where they have um, cheatgrass comes in and then causes, um, is directly related to wildfire, and so wildfire is also a big issue in these areas. Cheat, you know, cheatgrass is allowing more frequent and probably intense fires um, to go through sage grouse habitat. Um, it's it's probably it's not as big of a deal in Montana and Wyoming, but we still have that issue. Conifer expansion, where conifers are coming down into the sagebrush prairie, not only structurally is that an issue, but they also start to suck up a lot of the water um, that the prairie would use. So we have a little bit of that in southwest Montana. But that's more in places like Oregon and, and Idaho. Um, and then uh, agricultural conversion, so turning up of sagebrush for cropland, and that's a really big deal in Montana. Um, and we would consider that the main threat to sagebrush habitat here. And so um, that really leads to why we're doing a grazing study. Once you start turning up sagebrush, um, 
it takes decades for it to come back. Um, slow growing and there's been a lot of work done that you know sh shows it can take 30 or 50 years um obviously it depends where you are but um we definitely want to try to keep it intact and so in montana um the number one goal of sage grouse conservation is to keep working ranches intact to preserve these huge areas of sagebrush um and so over 50 percent of sage grouse habitat in montana is privately owned and in our the area that we were working, um, over 75% is privately owned. So being able to work with private landowners and, and keep these large ranches going uh, is really huge for conservation. And then beyond that, once we are able to um, keep these huge landscapes intact, how, how best do we manage um, for sage grouse, knowing that the largest land management practice in the West is Livestock, livestock grazing, so how do we use that as a tool? Um, so um, this is a map of the, the what are called core areas. This is um, delineated by FWP back in 2013, actually. And the hatched polygons are showing you areas of highest breeding density of male sage grouse. Um, there's an assumed uh, population ratio of males to females of one to one. We don't know exactly what it is, but so these are areas of high population and um, they're going to redo this map, I think, in a couple of years. Um, but this is what we've got for now. And our study is located in one of those core areas. And we're mainly interested in um, it's the project started to look at the effect of the Sage Grouse Initiative, which is an initiative created by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, federal agency in the US. Um, and, and so they basically work with landowners to do these voluntary programs to not only help um, make sustainable rangeland for the landowners, but also improve habitat for wildlife. And so this is their program. Um, and they, they implement it all across the West in several states. Um, and it looks different depending on where you are. So just like the threat to sage grouse habitat is different depending on where you are, um, the program is as well. And in Montana, they really focused on grazing in central Montana. In other places like Oregon, they would do conifer removal, um, things like that. But in Montana, we're really focused on the grazing. And so we wanted to look at lands that were enrolled in this initiative and did this voluntary grazing system versus lands that did not to see if we could see is that system making a difference? And just, just to give you an idea, just a really general idea of um, what their systems are about. Um, so they try to achieve utilization rates of 50% or less of the current year's growth. Um, the duration that livestock are in pastures is less than 45 days. And each year they change the timing of grazing in a pasture. So if it was grazed, in the spring one year, they might wait till you know mid or later summer the next year. So it's always changing by at least 20 days each year. And then it's these programs are custom made for each ranch. So, so they work with a landowner um, to determ determine how best that's going to work. And um, and if things happen like fire um, or you know water issues, um, that they, they can adjust. And just a really really basic schematic to look at um, a rotational grazing system. This is not specifically what NRCS did in our area, but just in general, like if you were thinking about a Hormaeus rotation system, um, you would have, you know, maybe three pastures. Um, it, they would start out in year one in the, in the orange pie. Um, and then after however many weeks, they would move to the green slice of the pie there. And then they might go off actually to a wintering pasture, which isn't displayed on this um, schematic. And then, um, but that, the key is that that blue pie is rested all year. Um, it's not grazed. And then in year two, they would rotate how that occurred, which pasture was rested. Um, so that's the general idea. And beyond the, the just very broad and large um, comparison of the SGI system versus non-SGI systems, we wanted to do a finer scale analysis. So um, we categorized each pasture that our birds used into one of four categories um, based on timing of grazing. 
Um, and so we tried to categorize them based on the bird's ecology, which kind of dovetails with the um, plant phenology um, going on. And so from roughly April through mid-July, we consider that our nesting category. 95% um, of our birds have all nested within that time frame. And that, that or also corresponds to um, the time of plant growth and reproduction. And then we considered category two uh, brood rearing, which was roughly mid-July through mid-September when broods break up. Um, and this corresponds with, um, usually is after seed set for a lot of um, plants. And then the fall and winter um, is our third category. And this is when plants are dormant um, and all the birds are adult sized. Um, so, and then the fourth category, I should have listed them out on here on the slide, I apologize, is rest. So they were not, the pasture was not grazed at all. Um, so we're, we were hoping that this would give us a, um, a better idea of how grazing is affecting sage grouse and their habitat. Um, and to give you an idea of a scale that we worked on, um, so this is not our final spatial grazing layer, but what we did was we took all of the pastures in our study area, um, we digitized them, um, and this is not the full complete set, which we literally just finished probably like a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, but basically we digitized all the pastures and the grazing information associated with them that we got from landowners directly or from NRCS. Um, so it's this huge area. We work with over 40 landowners, um, basically getting information like turn in and turn out dates because timing of grazing is the main thing we're looking at. Um, we do have some stocking rate information, but it's for um, a much smaller subset. So I don't know if we'll be able to look at that or not. Um, and to give you an idea, um, it gets kind of complex because um, the SGI system, so if, if these are basically um, contracts where grazing is implemented for three years. That's what landowners agree to. They might, they, they might be working with NRCS a couple years beforehand to put in things like fencing and water, um, but they actually implement the rotational systems for three years. And so through this whole 10-year study, there were ranches getting enrolled or coming out of enrollment and the status of a pasture changes each year. So if it was grazed in the spring this year, it might be you know, grazed in the summer next year. And so um, these four maps are showing, so in 2015, there's one, it looks like one rested pasture in this little zoomed in area. Um, it's still there in 2016, but they added a little to it. And then in 2017, that pasture changed and is not rested at all. So um, it, it makes it really, complicated from an analysis standpoint, <laughs> um, but that's the kind of data that we're dealing with. Um, so the main objectives of our study are to measure the vital rates. Um, the, there are three vital rates I'll talk about in a second that are known to affect population growth in sage grouse um, and relate these directly back to habitat variables and other drivers like precipitation, temperature, things like that. Uh, we also want to identify seasonal movements and habitat use, um, and then measure the direct vegetation response to grazing. Um, and so we chose to measure hen survival, nest success, and chick survival. These are the three vital rates shown to most influence population growth in sage grouse beyond things like, you know, large, you know, clutch sizes, um, you know, male survival, things like that. So we focused on females their nests, and then their brood. And to do this, we marked and monitored hens uh, with VHF tags that last at least two years um, and monitored them from the ground during roughly March to August, um, at least twice a week. Um, we used these tagged birds to find their nests and monitor nests. And if the nest was successful, we were able to go in and capture the brood at anywhere from two to eight days old usually, and put a little radio tag on a couple chicks from that brood so that we could monitor brood habitat use and independent individual chick survival um, and see what affects what affects their survival. And those the tags that we put on those chicks last um, 60 to 100 days. 
they usually last long enough that the chick is adult size, um, which occurs anywhere from mid-August to, you know, and later. Um, so we were able to recapture those chicks often and put adult size transmitters on them so we could follow them for their whole life cycle and hopefully uh, look at things like recruitment into the, the breeding population. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this is we monitored, did a lot of monitoring from the ground with VHF radio transmitters. Um, so this is Mark Sapinski. He's listening for hens in, in uh, an area on our study site called Devil's Basin. Um, and then we also fly once a month in the off season. So from September through March, we do telemetry flights once a month to gauge um, survival during the fall and winter and also habitat use. Um, and then also to find lost birds that, you, you know, throughout the season that disappear on us. Um, and for the last two years of our study, we were actually able to put out GPS tags on birds. Um, and if you're not familiar with these, um, these are pretty cool. So they were donated by BLM. We had 40 tags and um, they collect way more data than we're able to just on our own by ground monitoring. So they um, they collect anywhere from four to 10 locations a day versus, versus us going out twice a week. Um, birds don't get lost. <laughs> They're always sending signals unless something happens to the tag, um, which these are solar powered. They rely on the sun to charge them up. And so in times of year like this, like we are now in winter, um, if that solar panel gets covered up at all, or that, you know, and it doesn't get enough daylight, we might lose signal for a little bit, um, which does happen. Or if you don't put the tag on right, feathers cover it, and then we lose it. But um, when it works, it's really great. Um, most of ours did work really well. And then you can answer more questions, not just habitat use, but how are they using habitat? Are they avoiding certain areas? Because you get that really fine, fine scale detail about um, when, when you're getting several locations a day. Um, so this this will be really cool, and we're looking forward to looking at that. But that was the last two years of our study that we had those tags out. Um, and then again, we're we are trying to retag chicks that survived um, to be able to follow them for their entire life cycle. Um, so we did at least 56 individuals over eight years. That means roughly, I think it seemed like around 10 chicks survived each summer um, to be able to put adult tags on them. And once in a while, we had land that we couldn't access, so, so some of our chicks that survived didn't get tagged, but, um, but for the most part, we were able to do it. And um, other things we were measuring, so I was mentioning we want to look at the um, at nest arrival. We're also looking at the nest site selection. Um, we're going to be looking at brood selection and then adult hen habitat selection. Um, so we have ground plots where we actually go out to nests and random points throughout our study area. We set up these 30 by 30 meter plots and measure um, measure lots of metrics. I'll show that in a second. Um, we also have the grazing data, um, pasture by pasture. And then we have weather data that we're, um, we get from the weather stations that were set up. There were a couple in our study area, but it's from um, Daymet, which is out of Oregon, I believe. Um, it's a one kilometer square grid. We get things like daily precipitation and temperature um, and all of that. So, um, so we had we measured several vegetation metrics, and in fact, we had a field crew de dedicated solely to measuring vegetation <laughs> metrics that we measured hundreds and hundreds of plots. Um, so, so we'll have that data in addition to we'll also look at like remotely sensed data. Um, so it'll be interesting, but so vegetative height and cover, litter cover, um, which is dead vegetation on the ground, um, a mound of bare ground, um, how many forbs or flowering plants, um, which can serve as food for sage grouse, um, sagebrush cover. And then we also even looked at like percent cover of native and non-native plants um, and forbs species diversity and abundance. Um, we, in addition to the grazing data we got from landowners, we also did some of our own indices in our plots, like counting the number of dung packs um, and then also percent of plot grazed. Um, and then one last layer to add on top of this. Um, so we have the plants, we have the birds. 
Um, and we had some of the food for the birds, but we also, sage grouse also eat a lot of insects, um, just like a lot of other birds do, particularly for chicks in the first two weeks of life. They, um, they really need um, invertebrates because they're so high in nutrients, they're so high in protein. And, um, and so we are working with the Spatial Lab at the University of Montana. Um, they're helping us develop a spatial bug layer for our area. So all of those black dots represent, we created this grid across our study area where we could sample. Um, the yellow stars are where we sampled this year. Um, we have sampling from other years in, uh, in other areas. So we just tried to cover as much of the study area as possible. We did sweep net sampling um, to get at uh, biomass of bugs across the study area. And we're sticking it in a model um, so it would be bug, bio, bug biomass as a function of uh, several variables. And we've been investigating a lot, the, things like temperature and precipitation and um, some of the veg vegetation metrics we've been looking at to see how well they predict bug biomass. And then wherever our birds are in the study area, we can link those up with what the predicted biomass is um, in our study and be able to put that in survival models. So that'll be a really cool product to come out of this study i think this is what it'll look like the different colors will rep represent um the abundance or sorry the biomass of bugs um across the area um and so main takeaways so far from our work so as i mentioned we just finished our last field season we are um in write-up mode right now <laughs> so we do have some pre preliminary products that have come out of this research from the first five years, we had a PhD student named Joe Smith who um, wrote up the first five years of results. And now Jenny Helm, who's our current PhD student, she will be helping us to write up the rest. But um, just, just some basic information over the 10 years that we've worked, hens had a survival, an annual survival of 41 to 78%. And this is right in line with what we see in other sage grouse populations across the range. Um, their nest success was anywhere from 30 to 71% in all years. And that's pretty, that's actually really pretty good too. And it falls right in the range that other, um, other pop, pop populations have shown. And then our tick survival has been anywhere from 19 to 60%. Um, and this is generally um, in wildlife, you expect juvenile survival to be lower um, just because, you know, they're most vulnerable usually in those first the first part of their life and they're um, learning and they're not quite adult size and things like that. But it also shows that it might be a life stage to key in on um, when you're thinking about conservation. Um, and so we, we had a couple low years in there, but also a few good years. Um, we were able to monitor a large amount of individuals um, and you know, 502 hens. So we basically, we would tag a hen and she would be monitored for a few years, however long until she died or or the tag failed. Um, and so uh, this was a large amount of hens to monitor. Um, 767 nests, um, because hens, uh, if their first nest fails, they will attempt to re-nest usually. Um, and so that's why we have such a large number of nests. Um, and 535 chicks. So we, um, have a decent amount of data. And this is just a visual of hen survival. Um, and it's looking at it seasonally. Uh, and so um, these are all right within the range that we see in other studies, um, but it's just kind of a seasonal look at it. Generally in sage grouse, they tend to do pretty well in the winter. Um, and in our population, the fall tended to be kind of a time of low survival. Um, summer they did pretty good and um, yeah so that's that's just what we were able to observe um, that's just the again the seasonal survival by numbers but um, it's kind of a lot to look at uh, um, nothing really that stands out there though um, nest success um, so that's that range of 30 to 71 percent um, we did have a few individuals and not every year, but once, once in a while we get a third nest out of them. Um, but this is just, just some numbers behind nest success. And again, we weren't too worried about nest success. That was, all of this is within the range observed in other studies. Um, so they're really doing, you know, pretty okay in that respect. 
Um, and then Joe did some analyses um, looking at nest survival. Um, and all those vegetation metrics I was telling you about before, um, he threw those into his models. Um, and it was really interesting. He also looked at grazing. Um, the only thing that re really came out as influential on nest survival was precipitation. Um, so really big rainfall events, um, rainfall four days. So this means four days prior to a nest event, like a failure or success. Um, most nests fail, a lot of nests failed with these big rain events, which often include hail and things like that. Another uh, variable that came out as influential was distance to road. Now these are highways or county roads, so big roads, not, not two tracks, um, but kind of bigger roads. Um, they tended to survive better if they were farther away from these roads. That graph on the right is showing the relationship of survival with precipitation. Um, and then this, this graph is now switched to the relationship of survival with distance from major roads. Um, and we have not yet found an effect of grazing system on nest survival. Now, for this, for this analysis, this was the broad, just looking at the SGI system versus non-SGI. So was the land enrolled in SGI or was it not? Um, so it's very broad. Uh, we also looked at within SGI, was it rested or not? Um, and there's really no difference here in daily survival rates of nests. Um, the confidence intervals overlap. Again, this is work by Joe Smith. Um, and then this also, he also looked at um, the vegetation response to grazing, which I'll show again in a minute, but um, we didn't see really big differences between um, SGI enrolled lands and non-SGI. Um, and again, this is the first five years of data. Um, so the main takeaways so far, most of our preliminary products that have come out are related to nest success. They be, hens basically had lower daily nest survival um, uh, with large precipitation events. Um, they had slightly better nest survival when they were farther away from major roads. And um, we have not found effects of grazing covariates yet. Um, and then right now we're currently working on an analysis with all 10 years of data to see if these relationships hold up. And we also want to use our finer scale, like our pasture level treatments I introduced in the beginning. Um, so that has not been done yet. Um, and then looking at nest site selection from those first five years, um, hen selected nests that were farther away from county roads. Um, so that's looking at um, a, a scale of one mile from the nest. Um, and then when you drill down to a, within 100 meters of a nest, they generally nested in gen gentler terrain, so not big hills. Um, they, when, when you look at a plot level, which we're calling within 15 meters of a nest, um, they nested in areas with greater sagebrush cover. And they picked they pick shrubs with greater shrub volume. So again, this is Joe's work um, when he was at University of Montana. And um, so right now, right now um, preliminarily, we are seeing grazing management likely has negligible effects on nesting sage grouse in our area. And when we look at chick survival, um, this is um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Uh, this is with all of the years pooled. Um, and we came out with uh, a median survival time of chicks of 40 days, so just over a month. And um, a 95% confidence interval of 32 to 58 days. Um, but that's, again, looking at all years pooled. There's definitely um, different by year. So, I didn't put the confidence intervals on here because it's already so messy, but this is just shows you the variation in years. Um, we had that really low year, that dark blue dotted line in 2018 um, versus uh, say 2019 where they had a really good year um, and everything in between. So, um, so yeah, we're currently in process of looking at what might be affecting their survival rates. Um, so we are looking at grazing and then all the vegetation metrics and that's in progress. Um, as far as looking at the effect of grazing on habitat, um, 
the first five years of the study, we really haven't seen a difference between SGI and non-SGI. Um, that figure on the right is looking at the two grazing systems, and then um, that's actually nest success. So you're not seeing a, a big difference in nest success. Um, and one of the reasons you, you know people speculate is that um, that's an indirect effect of vegetation. So um, we don't know that for sure, but you know that's yeah. So we don't see a big difference um, in grazing systems in the vegetation, and we're also not seeing it in the nests. Um, but we are redoing that analysis with the full 10 years of data to see if that relationship holds. Um, but basically, basically what we've been finding is that annual variation is way greater than um, the effects of grazing strategies on vegetation, and also seemingly on birds. <laughs> um, so um, the other thing to keep in mind, which I'm noting at the bottom of this slide, is that um, we can only we only had a certain amount of variation in our study area. Um, so we don't have stocking rates from all of our landowners, um, but if those were all fairly similar, we might not be able to detect an effect of grazing if we're not seeing extreme, um, you know, like high stocking rates or really low stocking rates. Um, and that'll come out in our work as we publish it, but um, it, it, heterogeneity on the landscape and then and within our variables affects our ability to detect um, like an influence of a variable. Um, so products that are going to be coming out in the next couple of years, um, we're building a model that links population trends to habitat. Um, we are also going to um, index let counts to population model estimates um, to see how well let counts indicate population health. Um, and then how can, how does the, you know, is it a good, a good tool to keep using um, for that purpose? And then create maps of high quality seasonal habitat. Um, so for those population models, um, an idea is to do an IPM, but basically take data from different sources. So um, like for the abundance model, we have male let count data, which is an index to population size. Um, we have telemetry data from nest success and chick um, for, from nests and chicks, um, but we have telemetry data for that information. Um, we have hen survival information. So putting those all into the same model with habitat variables, uh, we haven't done it yet, um, but that's a product that's coming that will be coming. Um, and those high quality seasonal habitat maps. Um, this is just an example from a study in Wyoming where they. Uh, did this, but you know the the idea being you be be able to tell based on color um, the probability that birds would use it. Um, we can overlay something on there with um, based on areas they're selecting to that have high or low survival there. Um, what are the bang for the buck areas for uh, to conserve basically or or to prioritize? Um, and we would extrapolate to areas with similar habitat if it was appropriate. This will largely probably just be inferred to central Montana. Um, and then we are, so Victoria Dreitz, who's our collaborator, she also has a um, songbird grazing study in our same area where she's looking at songbird communities, so the effects of grazing on songbird communities, um, and in particular, some species like Brewer Sparrow, Vesper Sparrow. Um, so that work, um, is, is also coming out. Um, and then just the bugs. So we're trying to look at a few different components of that ecosystem. Um, and we will be producing a report to tie inferences together from, from the invertebrate project, the songbird project, and the sage grouse project. Um, they're all kind of finishing around the same time. I just want to mention too, because um, it's kind of nice to look at what's happened from other grazing studies. There are a lot of sage grouse grazing studies going on right now. Um, there are a couple in Montana, so ours and then uh, Montana State University has a, um, a sage grouse grazing project in the Centennial Valley, so southwest Montana. Um, this is actually the FWP and M Montana State University worked together on a, a sharp tail grouse grazing study. And this was actually looking at FWP managed grazing systems um, and the effect on sharp-tailed grouse um, in our eastern Montana. So in the mixed grass prairies, 
Um, this was led by Lance McNew and his PhD student, Megan Milligan. And um, some general takeaways from that study, um, again, they didn't have maybe the variability in stocking rates to de detect an influence of grazing if it was there, but they in general didn't see an effect of grazing. And this is um, an FWP grazing system that was already established and had been in effect for I think at least 15 years. So um, that was that was a fairly interesting result. Um, we didn't see a difference in adult survival between FWP grazing systems and the surrounding area, um, but they did find an effect of cropland um, that had a neg negative effect on survival. Um, and that's similar. Um, we haven't. We are. We will be looking at um, an effect of cropland in our sage grouse analyses for our study. Um, but Joe Smith in 2016 published this paper about the effect of crops on um, sage grouse lek persistence. Um, so this cropping is not isolated to the sharp-tailed grouse st study that we had. Um, the amount of cropland surrounding uh, leks really has a huge effect. Um, so yeah, just to wrap that up, um, in sharp-tailed grouse, um, they had, you know, nest site selection and survival was really driven by small-scale vegetation. That is different from our sage grouse, uh, um, but but similar to our sage grouse, they didn't find an effect of rotational grazing over season-long grazing is what they were looking at, um, and it's possible that the rotational grazing that was occurring on the study area didn't create the heterogeneity at the scale that grouse, uh, that was relevant to grouse. Um, so those are some of the things. And I'll, I'll give you a list of those papers that have come out as a result of that work. Um, I would, so <laughs> these are links. So FWP's website is currently uh, under construction um, and they've got most of it up, but they don't have our research site up yet. Um, so I can send an update, updated links when we can finally get that going. Um, but we will have um, we will have that up on our site, um, which usually looks like this. Um, you can click on the different projects and then see the different papers that have been produced. These are all freely available for download um, once they get our site up and running again. Um, but a lot of the work I was talking about today from Joe Smith, um, this is a list of the papers um, that he produced on that. Um, and I can, I, I think, um, you know, we can make this list available to you guys so you can look them up if you want. Um, and the sharp tail grouse papers, um, a lot of the work that Megan Milligan did with Lance McNew, um, it's a list of the papers. And they did some songbird work um, and a look at the predators in the system as well. Um, and that's also been, been published. So um, I just want to acknowledge our funding um, our current funders, we work off of um, PR dollars, um, but also the Bureau of Land Management is currently funding us. Uh, previously, we've been funded by the Safari Club International Foundation, um, Intermountain West Joint Venture and Pheasants Forever, um, NRCS, and uh, our state agency, FWP, and also Big Sky Upland Bird Association. And that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much. That was a really, really great presentation. So thanks for sharing your research with us and, and all of those um, wonderful resources. <laughs> I know I was making some notes there at the end about uh, different papers to look up. So uh, thank you for that. We do have um, a few questions from, um, from some of our listeners. Um, Peter is wondering if anything is being done on conifer encroachment into critical range. Um, so there's a lot of work coming out of Oregon um, looking at conifer, conifer removal and its effect on sage grouse populations. Um, and I could probably find um, a couple of those papers to send you those citations. Um, there's not, so most of the sage grouse work in Montana um, has been related to grazing. I know that NRCS has done some conifer removal in Southwest Montana, um, but most of the research has been um, with grazing um, and looking at other things. Um, but yeah, conifer removal in the other states, um, I could probably find some papers for you if you're interested in that. 
Um, I'll let Peter type in. It looks like he's still um, still on the broadcast, so if he's interested, he can mention that. <laughs> yeah. um, our next listener, Erica, um, she's wondering, uh, do the GPS and telemetry units impact survivability for chicks or hens at all? Do you know anything about that? Right. So we always, um, uh, the first year that we tagged chicks, uh, we did look at survival of broods, you know, chicks and broods that weren't tagged. So we, we follow broods whether they're tagged or not. Um, and we do spotlight checks on them if we don't have uh, individual radio tags on chicks. So we can tell how many chicks that the hen started with um, when the nest hatched. And then at 35 days, we do a spotlight check where we can count the, count the chicks with the hen. And then we also um, did some spotlight checks two months after hatch, so at 60 days. And when you look at hens that still had chicks in those broods versus, um, you know, hens hens with tag chicks that still had their broods or if the tag chick died, there was not a difference in survival. Um, and one rule of thumb we use when putting tags on birds is we um, tried to keep it at 3% or less of their body weight. Um, and so, yeah, we didn't see a difference in survival of chicks. The, um, we did not see any effect on survival from the VHF tags. Um, but there has been some work recently with the GPS tags. Um, we did not see effects on survival um, with the GPS tags we had. So we had 40 GPS tags that we put out in the final two years of our work. But um, uh, I could send you the paper. I'm forgetting the last name of this person right now who headed that paper. But there is, they did find an effect of GPS tags on survival. And it's really interesting. Um, because they just they're so they're attached to the birds differently um a vhf tag is like a necklace um that you fit around the bird's neck and of course you know we know the right size to fit and it doesn't seem to affect them behaviorally we put we put the tag on they fly away um the gps tags are are more like a backpack harness um so there's been a lot of work figuring out the best materials to use to make sure it's not um, you know, digging into their skin because it goes around their legs basically and sits on their rump. Uh, and so it is a bigger tag. Um, it's still within like 4% of the bird's body weight. Um, and, but it's, they definitely behave differently when you put them on. So <laughs> they, they tend to try to get it off more. Um, and, and so, yeah, so they did not find an effect of survival and they've been used in several studies, but, um, I, it's something to be careful of looking at in the future because it's, some people have found an effect on survival. Hmm, interesting. Um, one of our listeners is wondering if you've had, um, if you've observed any effects with the GPS transmitters on the hen breeding success. Do you think it impacts you know, anything there? Um, we haven't observed um, any differences in like um, nest initiation of hens or um, in net success. I, th I think once that tag is on, I think it's, you know, those first few days when they're getting used to it. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't see a difference, you know, they nested and it was fine. Um, they seem to make it just great through the rest of the season. Um, and, and yeah, so, and there are a lot of studies where they haven't found um, effects on survival. Um, but yeah, it's, you, you definitely, um, we were we were pretty uh, intent on their behavior once we put those tags on. If we ever were in question, like it just didn't look right or it wasn't sitting right, we um, took the tag off because the birds didn't fly away immediately when we put those on. So um, so yeah, but we haven't seen an effect on nest success or or their ability to initiate nests. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks for that answer. Um, one of our listeners, David, is wondering if you've been able to determine the causes um, of mortality for chicks. Like, is it um, terrestrial predators, avian, weather? Do you know what's going on there? Right. So, um, so for the for chicks, the first couple weeks of life is the most important. Um, I could put that survival curve up again, but we tend to lose most of them within the first few weeks and they cannot thermoregulate when they first hatch. Um, so they need to stay with mom. They need to, to brood under her at night um, and we, when they're really small. And so um, weather can be a factor, um, especially because in central Montana, 
most of our precip comes in May and June, which is right when nests are hatching. So if an unfortunate hen gets, you know, they get stuck with the nest that's about to hatch and there's a big storm that comes through, that could have a big effect. Um, not only just, um, you know, if the hen ends up leaving that nest, um, the chicks can't keep them. So, you know, or right when the chicks hatch and they're brooding, if the hen doesn't keep them warm, they're gonna have problems. Um, but also in these big rain events, when hens are sitting on nests, um, just like speculation here, we don't know for sure, but it might make them smell better to, you know, be more smelly so that predators find them. Um, but so we've had hens taken off of nests by predators and then um, the nests will, will fail. Um, when the chicks are young, um, they're a lot easier for predators to get um, because when they're that young, they can't fly. And so they're, their um, strategy is to just freeze or hide up under a sagebrush and just freeze, um, which we, we you know, observed when we were approaching broods to go tag them or, um, yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, they just, they can't escape like a normal bird would at that point. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, Aww. is the huge, is the huge <laughs> issue there. Uh, but once in a while, weather is the culprit. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Thanks for that answer. Um, speaking of weather, um, Troy is wondering if you experienced hailstorms in your study area, um, and if so, did you observe any negative effects from hail? Yeah, so those large precip events we we're talking about that really affected nest success, um, a lot of those had hail that came with them, and you could tell like hail would go through a portion of our study area, and it would just look like the sagebrush was bombed. I mean, it, you know, we had a couple really big hail. <laughs> And so just like decimated, you know, the area, um, these small areas, you know, a couple square miles or something like that. And uh, we did find hens that, you know, it looked like maybe they just got knocked out by the hail. <laughs> just, you know, it wasn't wow. to lose a lot, of, a lot of hens, but once in a while we'd lose one or two. Um, and so, yeah, that definitely has a big, big effect. Yeah, for sure. I live um, in Valmarie, Saskatchewan, and we got hit two years ago by tennis ball sized hail. And um, thankfully, it kind of avoided areas where the sage grouse are, are known to be found. Um, but I couldn't imagine the impact of, of such huge hail like that would be detrimental. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we've got a few other questions here. Um, Linda um, says one slide showing the estimate survival of chick survival by year 2018 was very low, it flatlined. Do you think this could be um, attributed to the impacts of the flash drought of 2017? Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, that's a really great comment um, because, yeah, so what we found um, is in years where we did have um, those droughts. So it could, I mean, we haven't look, looked at, we're still doing the chick survival analyses, but in general, we observed um, if there was a drought, um, and I'm thinking more current year though, um, towards the end of season, and I, it's, it's, it seems like sage grouse get concentrated in these areas where they're looking for water and food more so than in other years when it's more readily available. And so it's easier for things like raptors to pick them off um, because it's just easier to find them. Um, so that's one effect, but, um, but yeah, mm -hmm. if um, resources were low the previous year and, and then, you know, it could affect cover the following year. There's just a lot of things going on there. I, do, I don't want to say, uh, for sure, because we're we're doing the analyses, but just you know observations. Um, yeah, the it, uh, 2018. <laughs> it's just they just bottomed out that year. It was really unfortunate. <laughs> oh, it's too bad. <laughs> Uh, we do have a few questions about um, kind of the the movement of sage grouse. So, um, what's the furthest distance you had a grouse travel from the location you tagged it at? That's a that's a really great question. Um, so the interesting thing about sage grouse is some of the populations are um, are sedentary, so they stay in their area year round. Or um, some populations, like the, the sage grouse population on the Highland, closer to Canada, is migratory, um, and that's a lot to do with the winter weather because um, they just need to be able to be able to find sagebrush above the snow to be able to eat during the winter. And if everything gets covered up, they'll move south or go somewhere else. Um, and so our population is largely sedentary, 
but we do have birds that have moved over 40 miles from where we initially tagged them. Um, we've had some interesting adventures in the airplane trying to find lost birds <laughs> that whole <laughs> different areas. It, occasionally ours do uh, move quite a ways and they definitely can. Um, in our, our area, usually they can find sagebrush year round above the snow. So um, typically they don't do that in our area, but you know, Centennial Valley in Southwest Montana, um, that population, they'll go, you know, they'll go over 50 miles, they'll go into Idaho and other places looking for a place they can winter um, where they can find food. Wow, so it really depends on, I guess, their their summer habitat then and how far they need to move. Do you know, um, for the grouse that do migrate between breeding, um, the breeding season winter, how far do they go? Um, I'd have to go and, and uh, uh, to look at something to give you those exact numbers. Um, I want to say that um, in that Centennial Valley population, like I was thinking over 50 miles, I mean, they might go as far as 80 miles, I can't remember. Um, it's a long, they can, they can go a long ways, but I'd have to go look that up for you. I don't remember offhand. Yeah, Our birds, I guess probably until they, um, so I was just going to say, I guess until they find something to eat for the winter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. They go as far as they need, but I don't know what that longest distance has been. Yeah. For the grouse in your area that typically don't move, how big is their habitat range? Um, if like they're there year round, how much space do they have? Right. So, um, I mean, we have some birds that won't move more than a few miles from where they nested in a year. Um, they stay like right in that area and some will move, move you know, over 10 miles or, you know, throughout 10 to 20 miles throughout the course of the year and different uh, parts of the year. Um, and that's part of what we're looking at right now is, is that due to habitat, you know, um, even hens that have nests that are newly hatched, some of them will stay right, right in that pasture where they hatched, and some of them will will move these little chicks, a, you know, over a mile to different area um, just to start the brood rearing. And so, uh, you know, our question is like, why is that? Is, is are they not in optimal habitat when they nest? That they need to go find places with better food? Um, you know, what's going on there? And so, some of them will just stay within a few miles, but some of them have much larger areas. Hmm, interesting. Um, a couple of listeners are wondering if you observed any nest losses from, cap uh, from cattle tra uh, trampling or um, if you observed any negative effects from West Nile virus. Uh, so, um, yeah, these are, this is a really great question. So we only had one or two nests during the whole 10 years that were actually um, trampled by cattle. Um, and, you know, you could tell like, um, we would go, we would be monitoring nests every other day. And then, you know, there were cattle like right around the nest or in the area. And then you could go back the next day, the nest has failed and the eggs are smashed, you know, but that only happened once or twice. We really, um, and there is a study coming out of um, Southeast Montana that was done by one of our FWP staff where they actually saw increased um, brood survival. Uh, I think it, maybe even nest survival in areas that had livestock might have been brood survival um and that's be you know they didn't figure out why and their speculation was that um it kind of deterred predators from being around so um so the, that was just was really interesting but still in our case um you, you know we'll definitely look at that effect on chick survival we haven't just haven't done it yet but we didn't see a big impact on um nest survival and as far as west nile virus we had a couple years, um, and back to a question about um, chicks in 2018. Um, I can't, there were a couple of years in our study where, um, like in, in August or late August, all of a sudden we would see these die offs of birds that we would hear reported from landowners, not from our tag birds. Um, once in a while, our, I mean, we would have birds that die um, from, you know, they just they died, they weren't eaten or anything. and we would collect their carcass as soon as we could and send it in for testing. Um, but the problem is, especially with, um, well, with both VHF and GPS tags, it's really hard to get to the carcass in time enough to, um, you know, when they haven't deteriorated so that you can get a good sample. 
Um, so I, I won't say definitively we didn't have West Nile virus on our area. None of the tests came up positive, but I don't think any of our samples were really, really great. Um, but we did have a couple of years where people would find dead sage grouse around water tanks, um, things like that. And so, I mean, we don't really know for sure what happened, but you could guess, guess that maybe something like West Nile happened. Mm, mm. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that information. I think that's all the time that we have for today. Um, there's a few listeners that are wondering if you'd be um, willing to share your email address and open to receiving more questions afterwards, more more detailed questions. Is that something that you, you would be interested in? Sure. Okay, awesome. Um, I guess if... Um, if you wanted to maybe just type into the chat section there, um, like to all, the entire audience, your email address, then um, people can grab it that way and um, and can contact you directly um, if they've got more questions. I think we've got quite a few people on the line who who do work with sage grouse in Canada, so it's it's quite interesting. We've, we've always got a unique audience here and such a variety of people that tune in. Uh, okay. And we have so many more questions. I'm so sorry we weren't able to answer them all. <laughs> no, um, <that's> a... <laughs> yeah, uh, so... I just really want to oh, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, I was trying to find the, the chat to put in my email address. Um, cause this is anyways, you can tell me that at the, here at the end, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you so much again for the really awesome presentation and taking the time to, um, to answer all of our questions and everything like that. Um, to all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for catching today's broadcast. Uh, when you leave this webinar, you will, um, You'll receive uh, an email or a pop-up about a survey. It just takes one minute. If you don't mind filling it out, that would be awesome. And we can report back to our funders and keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. Um, and then, yeah, I just want to encourage everyone to check out the PCAP website and register for upcoming webinars that we have going on. So I guess that's everything with that. I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Um, and Laurel, we have a number of people typing in. Um, thank you so much for um, the really interesting research, the great presentation and overview, and thank you. Um, lots of people are typing that in. So <laughs> um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.